on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Thomas Frank is one of our most trenchant political uh, observers, uh, and I don't believe me, it takes a lot for me to use the word trenchant. He is uh, um, the author of uh, many, many books you should read if you haven't, including Listen Liberal, The People Come Unknow, and What's the Matter with Kansas. Uh, he has also been a columnist. He is a historian as well. And uh, a lot's been going on politically. Uh, and Tom has made a video to kind of sum up many years of writing. So it's a good time to catch up with him uh, in, in what is roughly the start of a new year. So without any further ado, Thomas Frank, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Richard, it's my pleasure to be here sharing the airwaves with you. Yeah, we were talking a little bit about radio voices uh, before the show. You know, when I was a kid in New York, there was a DJ named the Emperor Roscoe. I don't suppose you've ever heard of him. But the Emperor Roscoe. No. R-O-S-K-O. Not unlike the spelling of my own name. And it, it, this was when FM radio was coming in and it was the cool thing, right? And his intro used to be a bass going... Do, 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 do. He would say, <laughs> welcome, everybody, to the hippest of all trips, the return to reality. So <laughs> that's that, awesome. That's awesome. It great? He's yeah. and that's, that is what we need, man, is a return to reality. Yeah, well, that's what you're here for. Um, so you've got a new uh, video, which I think I've watched virtually all. I must have been right at the end when I had to break. Uh, uh, call What the Hell America. Um, yes. And yes. Uh, it's so an what, homage. The title is an homage to a, a, a book from the 90s that I'm looking for on my shelf called America, What Went Wrong? There it is. So the viewers, the people who can see this on the uh, on the internet, do you remember this book? I do remember. I forget. It was a, 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 it was two reporters for the Philadelphia newspaper did a whole series about uh, inequality in America. It came out in ninety one, and it was a massive bestseller, paperback and original. Uh, and the the cover had an upside down American flag on it. Uh, anyhow, it was about uh, inequality. This is at the tail end of the Reagan revolution, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Reagan and then uh, George Bush Sr. And uh, it was, uh, you know, all this sort of shock and uh, dismay at uh, inequality, you know, at how much more CEOs made than average people, you know. All, all, so the, the book is is just absolutely filled with statistics, you know, who pays the taxes, who doesn't pay, you know, all this sort of stuff. And it, and it, it actually and it was shocking at the time. And now you look at it and it's like we have gone so, so much further than that. Yeah, America uh, was a socialist paradise then compared to how it is now. I know, I know. So in my talk, I don't start then. I started in 1965, the year I was born. You know, there's this problem when you're trying to describe recent history. Where do you start? And so I was like, well, I'll just start there. Why not? I was born in 1965. This is the year of the, the Great Society. Lyndon Johnson was, was getting everything passed through Congress, Medicare, the various civil rights acts, you know, all of the, the war on poverty stuff, and was also getting us into Vietnam, the seeds of the seeds of the of his own destruction uh there in the all at the same time. And I think nineteen that was the year I uh, I bought my first album. Oh really? What yeah. was it? What was it? Uh, Wait, we should guess. We should guess. I'm going to yeah, say. Yeah. I'm going to say the Beatles. We're going to make an online <laughs> contest. Tom. We'll, 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 we'll the Beatles. Uh, I will leave it for an online contest. The Beach Boys. We'll leave it for an online contest. Um, <laughs> but but, the, yes. the, but the, that song. There was that. What was the big hit song that year? Um, Eve of Destruction. Right, right. Which was Eve of Destruction, which was Be Sergeant Barry. No, was that? No, Sergeant no, Barry? no. His name was uh, his name was oh, Barry McGuire or something. McGuire, Barry yeah, McGuire. Yeah, Barry McGuire, but he was not a soldier. No, no, that was somebody else. The Ballad of the Green Berets. But uh, yeah, which was a sort of knockoff Dylan, right? He said, yeah, yeah. It was like it was like a. a, a he was a, it was somewhere in that that space between the folk revival and you know the british invasion you're old enough for war yeah that's right for voting uh yeah that was, yeah 
yeah. The, yes. Uh, Great song. Uh, in, in its way, it was. Um, uh, so, uh, and I thought that was fascinating, by the way, your recap of the 60s and the politics of the time. Uh, so what the hell went wrong? I mean, we were not, I'm not saying we were great then, racism was endemic. No, you're right, no, it was, America was hardly a place without problems. I mean, geez, 1965, uh, you know, it, 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 but when I talk think about good things were happening, but this is also the year of the of the Selma beatdown, right? And this is right, the, right. The march to Montgomery, you know. But, but in the, terms of economic democracy, Tom. in terms of the direction we were going, now this is the critical thing about history. The, the object right. of history is not to just to say people in the past were bad. That's right. I mean that's what that's what that's what you know the people do now. That's that's how they understand history, but that's not. You know that's that's worthless you know that's that's an exercise in nothing the the thing is to determine the direction things understand the direction things were moving and we were moving towards social democracy in 1965 i mean king martin luther king talked about it all the time lyndon johnson talked about it all the time we were the most you know we were the richest country in the world we were uh, uh and uh, the thing the thing that gets me about it is we were not just a, a rich country uh, we are still, of course, today, but the the way wealth was distributed in America in those days was uh, surprisingly democratic. Working class right. people often made as much money or close to as much money as their white collar superiors. Uh, and this was, by the way, this is not like me with some startling observation. This was a cliche of the period. I'm going to pull another book off the shelf and show it to you. So there was an economics writer at the time, very popular, called uh, John Brooks. He wrote about the. I, I read him a lot, but this was a book of his from 1966, uh -huh. descri describing the rise of what they used to call the affluent society. Right. Basically, the idea of mass prosperity, prosperity for everyone. And the 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 the, the, the cultural touchstone that I always go to for that, Tom, is back in that day when I yeah, 10, 11, 12, I was 10, 11, 12. The cartoons we watched were the Flintstones and the Jetsons, right? Yes. And the, the average family. The average <laughs> family in Paleolithic times with a little stone <laughs> car that he moved with his feet. But the Jetsons, the Jetsons, this was the projection of what, uh, you know, 1999 would be like uh, based on the growth curve that the middle yeah. class was seeing. Uh, George Jetson, this was in the days of the single family, a uh, single earner family. George Jetson worked two hours a week at Space Lee Sprockets. That was his work week, two hours. And <laughs> on that salary, he could afford a saucer shaped home in the sky, a flying car, a robot maid, and to raise a family of four. And that was the expectation raised on the, based on the fact that yeah. worker growth and, uh, and uh, employer, you know, investor growth were, were rising at roughly the same rate. Yes. This, by the way, this is always uh, the, the sort of vision of the future from that period is always like that. The middle, you know, things are just going to get better and better for the middle class. It, the World's Fair was held that year in New York City. I was there. You were there? I, I so was evident, there. Evidently, I was there too, but I was an infant. My parents had this idea that that's what you did with an infant. You brought them to a World's Fair. Uh, I, and <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe it imprinted on some sub <laughs> subliminal level, but, but I remember I was very into futuristic architecture and technology and science and and you know uh, GM General Motors diorama of the yes. future was the big attraction the city of the future and of course a lot by of the way as it had been in the 1939 world's fair this was the the, the it was yeah it was the futurama in 39 but this was at the at, so at the 65 world's fair they had this is uh, Walt Disney uh, had a, had a hand in it and uh, they built this thing called the Carousel of Progress. Right. By the way, the which you, <laughs> which you can ride to this day at Disney World down in Florida. They 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 took it apart piece by piece and moved it down to Disney World. But it's exactly the same as what you're talking about. This vision of the progress of the middle class, you know, the middle the great middle class society and where we were going. And it's exactly as you described. And this they was, forgot one principle of a carousel, which is it's you end up where you began. <laughs> 
that's me being <laughs> metaphorical here, Tom. Excuse me. The, um, and I was also at the 1963 World's Fair. I was nine, and I remember because we went with my grandmother. The, Se the Seattle? Seattle World's Fair. And we went up to space. I hated all that. I was too little. But I do, uh, my vivid memory is of my French grandmother interrogating me about theology and then saying to my mother, Lynette, your children are going to hell. Oh, no. <laughs> so way, to, way to go, Grandma. <laughs> yeah, I associate the World's Fair with terror. But, <laughs> uh, but please continue. <laughs> well, look, it, the, the, the reason to bring all this up is to talk about you know how it, 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 how different we are today i mean same country uh same people i'm still here you're still here but the if you you know you look at what's at, at how things have changed over the years and it's it's absolutely the catastrophic uh you know you look at the uh, so at the the richest man in the world in 1965 was j paul getty oil right. billion, oil billionaire and he was worth a little over one billion dollars that was his net worth and uh he wrote an article for one of the popular magazines i forget which one i've got it around here somewhere where he's complete he, he's complaining about being rich he's like it's not all it's cracked up to be because the middle class man has as much as the rich person today so this is like so i you know i got to the top of the uh, you know the top of the of the heap and and look what it got me you know right. <laughs> nothing right. nothing right and i and I, you think about that today where the, you know the, the 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 billionaires earn you know many times what he, his net worth was in one year they shoot themselves up into space and the working class people the idea of the working class person living with the same standard of living as as a billionaire is is is, a, is you know comical it's a joke the middle class world is falling apart so i when i wrote i wrote this talk i was uh in kansas city and if you you know kansas city or the part of it that i'm from is doing you know this is the home of the creative class you know etc there it's doing very well white collar all that mm -hmm. uh it's heaven on earth if you're in the right group you drive out into the countryside or you drive around to certain parts of Kansas City and that that middle class society is falling to pieces. Uh, it's especially remarkable when you visit small town America. Uh, and I would say in the Midwest, but it's actually everywhere. Y you know, you see like s downtown downtowns of these places with 70 percent vacancy rates um you know buildings just standing there falling to yeah. pieces uh, uh you know the uh, you, look we cannot we we all know what's going on out there you know and the, the middle class standard of living is a dream that nobody has anymore that i mean the 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 uh life expectancy rate is going in reverse these days and not just because of covid because of what right. they call the deaths of despair right you know which is uh, alcoholism uh opioids guns you know this kind suicide. of suicide suicide yeah yeah and it's a uh, you know this this is the the great subject of our time you know this the destruction of that world that i was that i was born into the you know the middle class society you know you think about like the price of college it was it was almost free in 1965 it was free if you went to a state u in a lot of places and well, today jubilation again i mean i i hate to keep referring to you know my age in this but there was jubilation in the escrow household when i won what they call the region scholarship which was a test you took in what, uh, what state what state was that new york state and if you pat if you achieved a certain goal they waived the i think it was 235 dollar a month uh i'm sorry a semester tuition to any new york state university so you know or, or maybe it was a year i don't even remember but uh okay in today's dollars that might be 1500 dollars. but uh, uh you know the the vastness of the gap uh, but uh, uh, you know go ahead obviously oh, no i mean it's yeah. we all know we all know this is this is now you've got a generation of kids in, in debt i mean the price of college i'm i'm uh i went to the university of chicago for graduate school what does it cost now it's it's over uh eighty thousand for uh for a year that's all all included you know this is uh, we are coming apart as a society is what i'm getting at 
And then yeah. I try, and then I, and then I talk about, and I'm sorry, I'm doing a lousy job here. I just want, I no, want, I, I, I want, I want people to watch uh, the video I where, I, it's where, I, a, I'll I, where I, I, I do, the, I'll I do this much, much more convincingly. And, and, you know, the, we talk about, I talk about uh, labor. I talk about unions. I talk about wages. Uh, I talk about antitrust in all of these ways of looking at measuring our performance. We're going in reverse. The thing is, why can't we do anything about it? What the hell is wrong with us? Everybody knows this, by the way. Everybody knows right. it. Joe Biden knows it. Barack Obama gave a famous speech about it. Donald Trump gave many speeches about it in 2016. In some ways, this is because he spoke to the uh, the, the anger out there. He captured it in a certain way, in a way that Obama had done as well in 2008. They all do this. Bill Clinton, for God's sakes, in 1992, when he was on the campaign trail, waved a copy of America What Way. He would carry it around with him on the campaign trail. We all know this, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Richard. Tom, I know it does, Thomas Frank. And one of the things you talk about that I, you know, heartily agree with is the, the shift that the Democratic Party took from, and it's certainly something you've written about at great length, a very important topic, uh, the shift the Democratic Party took from being the party of the working person, you know, I used to say a working man, but, you know, working people, uh, to the party of the credential, you know, yes. uh, and yes. this is this is so important. This is an enormous shift, and it's it's often hard for young people to understand this. And the, the part of it that they can't understand, the thing about the Democrats being a party of the credentialed, party of the white collar, highly educated elites, they get that. It's the other part they don't get, that the Democrats were something different once. And I have to say, look, in 1965, they really were the party of organized labor. I mean, union, the unions built the Democratic Party. They were a huge, uh, they were enormously important in the Democratic Party. Uh, and that's, you know, that we can talk about how that changed, uh, how the party changed its focus. This is the, I've written you now two books about that. Uh, you know, it's a it is a fascinating subject. Uh, it took decades, but it is mission accomplished. It has fully happened. This is a party that 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 in the in its heart of hearts doesn't really have a problem with inequality. Doesn't have a problem with inequality because it identifies with meritocracy. It identifies with people who have done well on those tests who got the regent scholarship did you know got a got a you know great score on their sat i'm right. sorry i'm giving you a hard time no no yeah, no they, you're right you're right you're right uh, no they identify with the with the people who did well in school who got a gold star from the teacher uh who went to graduate school were Rhodes scholars uh you know what was uh, pete Buttigieg? what's his uh, claim to fame was he a Rhodes scholar a marshall scholar or something like that was, but th th this like is that. A, this is if you look at like um Barack Obama's, well, Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar. Barack Obama's cabinet was filled with these guys. Um, you know, I, I thought about writing a piece at one point called the Mandarin Democrats, you know, because the Mandarins, and maybe I should still write it, but the Mandarins uh, in, in, in Imperial China, you could come from the provinces and join the, elite, the elites if you pass certain tests of knowledge. That's what Bill Clinton did from Hope, Arkansas. That's arguably what Barack Obama did coming from Hawaii. But you you had to get into those circles of what in our society, the Harvard, Yale, whatever. Yep, yep, yep. The, the certification. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, look, here's the thing. So these people, and by the way, Barack Obama spoke very eloquently about what had happened to the middle class. He gave a great speech about this that really opened my eyes uh, at the time. It was 2011 because he gave it in Osawatomie, Kansas, which is uh, right. which is fairly close to Kansas City. It's about 40 miles from where I grew up. Where Teddy and, Roosevelt gave, gave what I think was basically the sort of founding uh, creed de corps of, prog of uh, 20th century progressivism, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And and why did Roosevelt do it there? Because Kansas at the time was identified with radicalism. Nobody remembers uh -huh. this, but it's true. And it was, uh, Osawatomie happens to be the home of John Brown. Hmm. John, uh, John Brown, who's my, one of my, he's, I've got his picture on my wall here. You can't see it, but it's there. John Brown was, uh, you know, he had his, his, his time in Kansas. They called it Bleeding Kansas. There was this border. Right. Bloody can't, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. The border war with Missouri, and he was sort of the leader of the uh, 
uh, the uh, abolitionist side in that in that war, and that was that was his hometown, and that's where he he led the local militia or whatever in a in a battle against uh, slaveholders from Missouri right there in Osawatomie. Anyhow, so that's the backstory. So Obama comes there to give this speech, and he's quite eloquent as always about this. It talks about exa- everything that I've just said. Talks about that in his own way, uh, it, using his own family story. Uh, his parent, his mom was from Wichita, Kansas. You know, he tells that story, and uh, you know, and it's great. And you say to yourself, these guys understand the problem. He totally gets it. How come he couldn't do anything about it? How come his administration did so very vanishingly little to solve the problem of inequality? And when I say that, I'm not just like you know, wagging my finger at him. I mean, on, on paper statistics, it, the right. problem got, the problem got right. worse and worse and worse during his presidency. And you can, you can point at the the mistakes that he made that, that, that caused that brought that about. Like, for example, that he never got tough with wall street. You know, he had the perfect opportunity. He's elected on this colossal majority has an incredible mandate. The whole world is behind him. He could have right. done any, anything he wanted to these guys. Like, you know, the world is looking for a Franklin Roosevelt to come in and, and, uh, and, and, and clean this, this industry up. And he didn't do it. Right. He, uh, everybody got their bonuses. Everybody got their bailouts. Nobody got, nobody got fired. You know, nobody, got, guess nobody was, got prosecuted. My guess was that, uh, but I'm curious, of course, I'm curious as yours, my guess was that, among other things, he wanted the approval of the in-group, the Larry Summers, and the, those types of right, people. Right, but why didn't why didn't they? Those are smart guys. They know this problem too. Why didn't they want to solve it? This is this is the great mystery of uh, of the Obama years that you have to you know that I try to answer in my in in my in in, in uh, listen liberal. You know these guys know what's going on. Why didn't what's what the hell happened? Why couldn't they take forceful measures? You know, you look at Lyndon Johnson in the 60s doing, you know, boom, 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 uh, you know, uh, 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 legislative Medicare. measure after. Yeah. Thing after yeah. thing after thing, you know, to to take to, to rights. Make America- yeah. Well, the Appalachian Authority, the Highway Beautification Act, he goes on yeah. and on. The, what the stuff the guy was doing was just incredible. And, uh, uh, you know, building schools, building roads and, um, uh, you know, doing all of these TVA style projects. Uh, and 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 Obama's not able to do that. Why not? And a big part of it is that the Democrats don't believe in that anymore. But what do they believe in? And you know the answer. To ask it is to answer it. What do they believe in? It's education. Well, you tell me. Education. It's always right. education. Right. So they they say we've got this terrible problem in America. The the middle class is is falling to pieces. What's the answer? Yeah. Everybody has to get a college degree. Everybody has to become like us. And this is this is so this is Obama's speech in Osawatomie. He he pivots from talking about the destruction of the middle class, as I say, very eloquently, to talking about the the solution, which is everybody has to go and make this. He called it an investment. You have to make your college investment. You have to you know. And this is when you think about. And this is that that whole generation of Democrats. This is always the answer. So Bill Clinton would also say the same thing. Look, where deindustrialization is happening globalization is happening there's nothing we can do about it we can't do it you know hey we're powerless you know the united states we're powerless to do anything about this the only thing that you can do is get is get an education you know and then the bosses will you know they'll approve of what you've done and they'll they'll pay you better and the market will smile on us and and the money will come back this is this is so much bs richard but they believe it. This is the Democratic Party sincerely up until now, up until very recently, sincerely believed this. Why? Why do they believe it? I'm sorry, I talk too much. I apologize. No, you don't talk too much. Um, and don't apologize. Uh, but they, uh, but they, they believe it for exactly the reason that you gave before, because they themselves rose via this mechanism. So right. both, both Clinton and Obama and basically all of these guys, that's how they made their way to the sort of um, exalted perch that they now occupy is is through by, by doing well in school, by getting high test scores, you know, doing all those and, things. And the end point became, yeah, I, I, I did a piece in 2012 on the Republican Party platform under Mitt Romney and the Democratic Party platform under Barack Obama. <laughs> the language was entered on education 
was interchangeable. The yeah. same yeah. buzzwords, education, opportunity. Uh, the opportunity is one of the buzzwords. Compete for the jobs of the future, which is a innovation. Future. Innovation. Right. Innovation. But compete for the jobs of the future. Is just yeah. Don't you love that? that and, 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 and if you think here's here's why it, here's why it's so infuriating. I mean, we all know that this is a this is not a solution. We can all see that. But what makes it infuriating is that this is not this is this is not an answer for inequality this is a way of rationalizing inequality right okay right. this is a way of saying these people on top they're up there because because they played the game right they're right. up there because they deserve to be up there they're up there because they're so smart which they, was did, the they old, did well in school and that was the old right-wing ideology that was the Horatio yeah, yeah. Alger, but the, the, they would the Ayn Rand thing but they would have put it differently they would have said because they succeeded in business they were you know they were good at they they they, they fought their way to the top it's just a different meritocracy so Democrats uh love the meritocracy of, of higher ed Republicans love the meritocracy of of uh you know corporate service or whatever small business but they don't love the meritocracy for example of becoming a teacher Oh, no. oh my god no <laughs> you know they don't fight the, they don't I know. the meritocracy I know. of being a librarian or yeah. a, a social worker or i know i just i have to say i mean we're i can feel that we're changing subjects here change it shifting gears i am so glad that i'm not in academia anymore oh. i mean i spent i spent the first half of my life i was one of these people by the way I'm like you. I did well in school. I took the tests. I got the scholarships. I did, you know, I got the, I got the the good grades. Uh, you know, I graduated with honors or whatever the hell it was. Uh, went to graduate school. You know, a premier. Blah 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 blah. Uh, and did all the things that you do. And uh, I am so glad I'm not part of that world anymore. My friends I mean, who are just they suffer. They. Yep. Yeah. Um, but now wait so, some do and some don't if you're old enough you've probably no, you probably, yeah. probably got tenure if you've got right. tenure if you got tenure and you're in the liberal arts it's hey it's 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 great just like always but if i talked to so many adjunct professors who have to work at starbucks to you know i was you know. one i was an adjunct yeah and i i can, so i was part of that so i don't want to say the first generation to come up against because it was building but i i got my phd in 94 and go out on the job market and it's like huh <laughs> what do you and, know there's, there's no jobs yeah uh, and, and so you go right you do adjunct work and it pays it pays so little and you're doing the whole the whole thing you're you're teaching you know you're teaching a full load uh and it pays you would not believe how little it pays yeah, uh, anyhow, I mean, it's a, no, yeah. it's a recipe. It's a recipe for for the destruction of of intellectual life as well. So we're talking about which is a, which is a goal. destruction of many things. I, of course. I mean, when are you going to see? I'm a, I'm an old John Dewey groupie. So you know, when are you going to see people talking about you know education as a vehicle for becoming better citizens or more rounded persons or becoming more fully you know who you already are or advancing the arts you know and literature nobody yeah, gives yeah, a to hell with that yeah, it's to just, hell with it's that so, stuff yeah, and to me what got, part of what goes along with that and, and you know you you haven't really you don't really touch on that that much in this uh talk which again is uh that well this is uh, hey i can't do everything in no one i know you can't Richard. do everything our friend matt taibbi has talked about this in his, his book hate incorporated and that's you talk about the liberal thinkers that came up that influenced a lot of this shift but also to me what that made me think of was you know you might call it the white collaring of of the working press you know to be a reporter it used to be a blue collar job if you didn't want to finish correct out, you went out and found some blood on the sidewalk you found out what yep. happened you know yep. you phoned and, it you phoned it into a rewrite guy that was yeah. the idea you phoned it in and a guy on the other end of the phone wrote it up it was right. uh this was the model but that's uh that was so that changed in the 1960s so this is yeah. the 1960s are are you know this transitional period in all sorts of ways but one of there's a, a book from that period called the boys on the bus well 70, i remember 70, well, 72, 72. Apple. yeah great he's in it yeah yeah it's a great he book oh yeah no, he, he, he did kraus did Lindsay kraus that, i believe that uh, that's the yeah. name yeah yeah but the the book has all kinds of con this is very early in the white colorization of the of the press and the yeah. book is like the book is one of these um tributes to that moment they're like 
Finally, the smart people have taken over journalism and we're going to show what we can do. The smart people are in charge. And finally, we're asking the tough questions. It used to be these blue collar people that didn't understand. Right. They hadn't gone to college. Uh, they, they were, you know, they were kind of stupid. They, they couldn't understand how power worked, you know, but now you've got these, these guys from the good universities are asking the tough questions. It was a, it was a, 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 tri- a trumpet blast of, you know, this is the new, this is what journalism is now. And yeah, that happened. Uh, and it's uh, it's never looked back. Uh, and uh, look, what to, to simplify everything that we're talking about here, when the party of the left has given up being a party of working people and is instead a party of, I don't want to say the elite, because there's a lot of elites in American society, right, but it is, it, it is the party of an elite, white collar, highly educated, very prosperous people. Um, when that happens, all sorts of things change. Your way of looking at the world changes. And when all of these other institutions like journalism also follow the same trajectory, there is very little. I mean, how many newspapers in America still have? Well, there aren't even very many newspapers in America. Right. Part, part of the phenomenon we're describing is the, the death of the newspaper. But uh, when newspapers were still alive and well, I used to always um, talk about how few of them had uh, labor reporters. Right. Nobody, they had nobody, business reporters, but they didn't right, have labor. Right. Right. Yeah. There's no, they didn't even have a labor columnist. I mean, the, the Times, I, I believe, I saw that the, either the Times or the Post has one again. Really? They, for, for, for many Dan years, they, for many years they did. He retired from the Times and now he was their last. He was one of the last. He was yeah. one of the last. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, it's insane when you think about it. Um, so the papers are part of it. But Tom, I, I also want to get to, you know, you made some great points in this talk. And again, it's called What, what the Hell, America? Uh, what the hell, America? What yeah, you hell? have to say it right, right. What and, 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 and you can find an easy link to it, by the way. If people are confused, you can find a link to it on my website, which is tcfrank.com. What's the C stand for? It's my middle initial. I know. What does it stand for? Uh, uh, so next question, please. Right. Okay. So we don't like our <laughs> middle initial. Interesting. Okay. Uh, you talk, <laughs> you talk, uh, you know, th- this is a, com- you go on to a conversation that we really need to have. And a lot of people, I think on, on the left, frankly, are kind of afraid to have. And that is the sort of, you, you know, you talk about the number of fake lefts that have sprung up. Yes, this kind is, of well, like this rooms is... in a in a more in a dank basement. You know, uh, yeah. So this is this is another one of my life. Um, everything that we're talking about here are things that I have been fascinated in for my entire adult life since I started the Baffler Magazine way back when, and you know, wrote about this stuff, and you know was in graduate school and I've been fascinated by this all my life that when you destroy the traditional left or when the traditional left obsoletes itself which is what happened in America the democratic party is not interested in being the party of you know working people anymore it's got a different model a model that is very much focused on education and on the uh, uh highly educated elite uh, and the righteousness thereunto pertaining. When you have a party of the left that does that and leaves behind, the traditional left is no longer um, the focus of a political party. What happens? And all of these different things, and this is a story of our times, by the way, all of these different things happen. Among other things, inequality spirals out of control. We all know that because neither party really cares about it. I mean, they know it's happening. Both Trump and Obama uh, and Biden, they all know it's happening. And they have their different ways of addressing it, but nobody really cares. Nobody really wants to do anything about it. Anything real like Lyndon Johnson or Franklin Roosevelt, nothing like that. Another thing that happens is you get, I mean, this space on the board. The traditional left is a very valuable square right on the on the chessboard it is a very strategic square and you get all of these different uh, uh uh efforts to grab control of that square not necessarily by political groups sometimes by political groups but also by uh non-political actors so wh- i wrote a book my first book was about the advertising industry In the 60s, I was fascinated by the advertising industry. I mean, they are legitimately fascinating. And one of the things that I noticed after writing that book is that advertising in our time has come to sound like old school leftist propaganda. (laughs) 
<laughs> now, watch. It is really weird, but 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 look at it. They model themselves after this stuff, and it's like they're trying to fill the space on the board. Trump was trying to fill that space on the board, and before Trump, Glenn Beck was trying to. The right has been trying to do this for years. This is what they call now. Um, this is what I call phony populism. This sort of fake populism that the right has dabbled in for a very long time. Do you remember a guy called Richard Vigory? Of a, course. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, he was one of the leading that. leading minds yeah. of what was called the New Right back in the uh, 70s. Right. And Vigory actually wrote a book about populism in 1983. Uh, and this was, I mean, populism is an Amer- is the sort of uh, uh, the na- one name that you could give to the traditional left that I'm talking about, the laborist, right. uh, multiracial left, you know, that's about social democracy. And and uh, uh, Vigory knew this, but he was like, you know, the right can occupy this space, uh, and th- th- that's been the uh, he didn't invent that idea by the way that was floating around in the ether even before then but it's that has become the sort of guiding idea of uh, of the right i mean trump trump is out there uh trying to trying to occupy the space in 2016 and rhetorically doing it to some degree now he didn't do anything as president he did jack all as president <laughs> you know? got another tax cut passed for the rich right deregulated the, everything you know and in the meantime i mean what i wrote about this because for some dumb reason but i don't know if you follow the the cracker barrel controversy you know cracker barrel. the restaurant the restaurant yeah southern themed restaurant i used to call it the aptly named cracker barrel you know <laughs> appealing to uh you know an image of a fantasy image of white essentially rural america and um you know a family member that shall remain unnamed used to love it so we drive up to uh, pennsylvania or wherever where there's the nearest one in bucks county and stuff her face with this you know home fries and everything but now you're being too negative i well, i like deep fried food i love it i love it i don't don't get me wrong i actually love cracker barrel but they introduced a vegan burger oh what? no and the right you know some right commentators they put out a facebook page about it went nuts yeah and then the left uh some people on the so-called whatever the left is now we're making fun of them far more people mocking the people upset about the vegan burger than <laughs> you know and that aren't, me, aren't the culture wars fascinating the culture wars are fascinating because uh, if, if is, you can remove yourself from them this is I, the hard the hard part which is you have to ta- you have to take a step back yeah and that's, but, it's very difficult to do but what i wrote about is somebody with common sense on the left stepped in and said listen this is a proxy for the fact that their entire world is disappearing around them and they don't know why and that other there you go. they feel like elites are deciding what they can do say eat you know uh, and they are and they are richard that is that is and yeah. we're all we're all oh my god so, so this, this is, I wrote, I wrote a- was saying have a little compassion people and but compassion is not on the menu so to speak on the left these days yeah. uh in certain quarters and you talk well about- not compassion for those people for 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 the, those, the, the, yeah, yeah that's like those are trump voters or that's the idea right. that's the stereotype right and and there's the i mean the the uh uh the contempt with which my fellow like uh liberals uh you know regard these these people is just it's overwhelming it's uh and it's it's just between you and me don't tell anybody i said this it's loathsome it is loathsome and it violates the sort of most fundamental moral principle of self-examination you know so well yeah but not just that it's like the whole idea of the left like those should be i mean look they should they should be our they should be with us the fact that they aren't is is like it's not just because trump it was trump is a is a slick salesman he is it's not just because fox news is hypnotic it is it's also because we failed and when we exactly fail, thank you thank yeah, you and and, the, and it's and 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 when we fail the answer isn't just to yell at the people that we failed for you know look these people have i don't know about the cracker bell controversy that you described before i'd missed that one but years ago i wrote a book about the culture wars it's called what's the matter with kansas right and it's uh you know i tried to yeah you know, i was going around the state interviewing these um 
conservative leaders, and they were enjoying uh, all the success in the state at the time. And they were only concerned about the culture wars. It right. was all culture wars. It's all they cared about. And it was uh, it was absolutely fascinating to me. And I sat down and tried to understand the culture wars. And maybe my understanding was original and maybe it wasn't. But it, it was exactly what we were talking about before. These are people who can see their culture changing. And they don't vote for that change, and they don't have any say in that change. Right. Their, their culture is especially – this is – by the way, you especially feel this in a place like Kansas. Your culture is beamed in from the coasts. You don't have a hand in making it. It is made for you. You just get to live in it. And they resent that. <laughs> I think that is a very human right. thing. I and they, totally they, agree. And they describe it with terms borrowed or stolen or swiped from the left. The people versus the elite. This is fundamentally, right. uh, this is this is the language of populism, which, by the way, came from Kansas. This is the language of a left-wing movement. And by the way, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. The problem is, the problem with all of this culture war crap is that there's not a whole lot you can do through politics to change the way Hollywood behaves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just terrible. I think so. You go, you turn on Fox News, and I, I've watched quite a bit of Fox News in my time, and they literally come up with new culture war causes every day. Every day they come up. I don't know. They must have a quota or something. Like come up with a dozen every day, and somebody, <laughs> somebody's back there just ge generating them, and they throw them against the wall, one after another. The different hosts do. And they they uh, they succeed or they don't succeed, and by the next day they're they're all forgotten, and they've got twelve more, and 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 by God, one of those actually works. One of those catches on, and they can tell that it catches on because you know uh, there's all sorts of ways of measuring that. And then they start then they start hammering that one, and you and there's this just constant churn, and it's always the same model. We the people, you know, we ordinary working class people are watching our culture get fiddled with by these these people who we didn't vote for, these people on top of our society, and there's nothing we can do about it, and we're really angry, and they're changing everything, and we don't like it, and, you know, maybe we're, you know, traditional in this way or that, maybe we like to, you know, uh, I don't know, eat at Cracker Barrel, maybe we go to, you know, whatever you know, traditionalist church or something like that. I, I don't know. Anyhow, the thing is that that uh, these are people who would ordinarily, based on an economic appeal, you know, you can apply the same thing to economics, and it leads you straight directly to the political left, not to the right, <laughs> not to the right. I feel as all all of this, Thomas Frank, on the left and the right to a certain extent, and again by left. I don't mean economic left, right? I mean, a sort of cultural left. Oh, I, I, sorry. That's what I am. I'm on the yeah. economic left. Yeah. No, me too. But I, I, I feel as if all of it is a kind of um, uh, what's misdirection that, uh, you know, I, I don't know what percentage of it is deliberate, what percentage of it is not. But the fact that we don't talk about, you know, we make our proclamations in the general area of the left or democratic left about the injustice, let's say disparities in healthcare, but we don't, racial disparities in healthcare, but we don't talk about the economic forces that are the engines of those racial right. disparities, well, because then yeah. that opens up a can of worms of well, okay. what about I, other I'm poor gonna, people. Can I, know? can I tell you something that I just came across the other day and it made yeah. me so mad and don't, don't repeat it. Okay. I won't don't, don't tell don't uh, tell your mil don't tell your millions of viewers about it. All right, and but if I'm already writing about it, all bets are off. Okay, watch. <laughs> so it was a uh, report to the governors of America about uh, what to do about the decline of small towns. Uh -huh. So uh, talking about you know rural areas all over America, and these are places that used to have a lot of uh, small businesses, a lot of sm light manufacturing, you know, et cetera, and it's all dying. Uh, and what do you do? And we talked about this at the start of the show. What do you do? And they said, well, you got to um, set up cr uh, uh, creativity zones uh, <laughs> and uh, creativity highways, and you got to like get people interested in doing traditional arts and crafts, and like d quilting or uh, bluegrass fiddling. Or something like that, and then you can bring in. Uh, That's going to work great. And, and, in and, and what, and what, and, yeah, what, no, no, it's for this for small towns, so rural oh, areas. Small and, towns, right. and what and what 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 pissed me off about it is that we actually know what's 
happening to small towns, and we know why. Right. And we know what the forces are. And it's basically it's a lot of monopolies, a lot of agribus, you know, uh, uh, corporate uh, agriculture, Walmart. Uh, you know what? We know what the forces are that are destroying small town America. We also know it doesn't have to be that way. Right. It's, it's not. This is not dictated by um, you know the invisible hand somewhere. You know, this is not written by the invisible hand. Lots of countries have dealt with this problem. I was just in France last summer. Small towns are still alive and well in France. It doesn't have to be this way. But the report both assumes it's like, well, nothing we can do, nothing we can do. And so these people that used to work on the assembly line at, at John Deere, or whatever, they have to take up a uh, bluegrass fiddling or whatever. They have to they basically have to live out a stereotype that we, the city dwellers, have of country people. Right. They have to, they have have to, to do the banjo picking or whatever the hell it is. Parts. Now, I'm a big fan of bluegrass. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I, well, I, so, I, well, so am I, but that's not that, that's like, that's no answer for a, for a, for a modern advanced industrial civilization. Now it's just not. It How, hardly not. seems to be, uh, the, you know, and this gets me to, but you know, when you try to bring up these economic issues in certain circles on the, broadly speaking, the left, you get into, uh what you describe you run the risk of in your phrase from the video being excommunicated for language and you use uh a phrase you quoted someone a, it wasn't bayard russin it was somebody else uh you use the phrase, he's my hero well he's my hero too and uh he called for raising the minimum wage in 1963 when in real dollars the minimum wage was considerably higher than it is now i wrote about that a few years ago I well, they, well they used to do it all the time back then yeah they uh but but it was i don't think it was russin who wrote about ideological patience that's that's larry goodwin yeah and larry and, goodwin that, was a was a, a fascinating man uh, uh was the great historian of populism and by uh -huh. which I mean uppercase P populism, the real deal, and was um, also heavily involved in the civil rights movement, wrote about it a lot in the 60s. And um, uh, after he was done he writing about these two movements, uh, civil rights and populism, he took a step back and he said, uh, and this is this is the larger point of everything that I write. And let, let me take a step back here before I, and then I'll come back to Goodwin. But we've just been through a real life experiment, RJ, in social democracy from the top down. We elected Barack Obama. He got two terms. He had a massive majority. He got it whatever he wanted, and uh, 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 and it it didn't do anything. It didn't change the the course that we were on. Uh, it didn't alter the distribution of wealth. It didn't bring back the middle class society. It didn't. It. it I mean, he he got. Uh, uh, you know, you, he got this very weak version of universal health care done. That's about the best you can say. Uh, but on the the main task for which he was elected, dealing with Wall Street, very very little. We just had this long experiment in social democracy from the top down. From the you know, president of Harvard is going to do it for you. All these smart guys gathered around the cabinet room are going to do it for you, and they didn't do anything. And we can now say, I think, conclusively that that model of reform failed. That model of reform simply does not deliver. There's a different model, though. This is one that that Goodwin wrote about all his life. The different model of reform, and that's reform from the bottom up. Right. That is that's what populism was. That's what the civil rights movement was, and that's what the labor movement in the 1930s was. To some degree, that's what the New Deal was. And Larry Goodwin wrote about this uh, all his life, and then he took a step back and wrote a theoretical essay about it. Well, how do you do that? I mean, it's difficult. How do you get to one of those great moments like populism in the 1890s, or like uh, the 1930s, or like the 1960s? How do you do it? And he said, you know, th basically the answer is you have to build a movement. You have to have a move, a giant, vast social movement, not of Harvard presidents, not of Rhodes scholars, but of ordinary people, by which I mean working class people, by which I mean people that didn't go to college. Uh, it doesn't mean college people are excluded or Harvard presidents are excluded. They can be part of it, of course, but the the the, the force and the energy and the even the leadership has to come from ordinary rank and file Americans. Well, how do you do that? And so he wrote a whole article about how you do it. And the part of it that really got me was he said, you can't, it can't be about ideological purity. He called that Leninist. 
he mm. uh, who he de- he despised uh, that that approach. He called it, you. It cannot be about ideological purity. Uh, you know, understanding things better than everybody else, having the right lingo, that sort of thing. It has to be about uh, you have to show what he called ideological patience. You can't judge the ordinary people. Your object is to bring them together into a mass movement that will make change in this sort of sweeping, overwhelming fashion. And they will be changed just by being members of the mass movement. But to insist, for example, that they that they know the rhetoric before they sign up. Or that they, you know, have the, the, you know, that they, that they speak the jargon or whatever it is, is automatically doomed to failure, automatically doomed to failure. That's, you know, when we to to, to build a leftist movement based on um, ideological purity is uh, a a disaster. It will you will never achieve anything. And the funny thing is, is that that's what we're doing right now. (laughs) No, it's definitely what we're doing right now. You know, I mean, my stepmother, who is very Christian, uh, he used to sign, had her email signature, I don't know, some minister, somebody said it, be kind for everyone is fighting a great battle, you know, which is kind of a nice sentiment, right? And it seems just decent, but it seems as if large segments of the left, and this is where the fake lefts that you talk about come in, uh, are intent on proving that it's not ne- it's wrong to be kind because nobody but you is fighting and your friends are fighting great battles right. and well and- you and you and your fellow uh fellow it's usually fellow journalists this is what so it's all everything all of this discourse has moved to twitter right you know, and and it's like a a, a a a ring of a tight little ring of journalists fighting everybody else and excommunicating constantly excommunicating everybody else this is the model you know, these highly educated people who know the lingo, who know the facts uh, and constantly batting down everyone else. It's 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 a war of all against all. And right. uh, that's the model. And maybe someday that war will end and somebody will win the crown. And somebody will be, you know, like, hey, I am the purest liberal of them all. And they'll be standing at a kingdom of rubble. <laughs> I know, you know because because outside that little world outside right. that little world these forces continued their way these, right. for, these forces keep keep moving the you know the economic forces that have done this to us they don't answer to you know they don't answer to the you know voices of the righteous you and, know, and- they, they, Right. Well, because the righteous aren't as righteous as they think, you know, because the truly righteous are trying to reach to uh, the people who don't always already agree with them, who don't know the lingo. But yeah, who that's, hearts, yes, that's the only know. way to do it. That's the yeah. only way to do it. Anyhow. I would say when people say, you know, well, I, I hate those people who do blah, blah, blah. And they say, well, then activism is not, you're not meant for that feel. That's, you know, that's not your gift because politics, activism, advocacy, it's all about talking to people who don't agree with you, don't think like you, and bringing them around to your point of view. And if you already hate them, you know, go find some other line of work where, uh, because it's a reason. It's funny how, is it, isn't that, you know? just, doesn't that just feel like common sense, Richard? It and, does. It's, and yet it is to say that to go out and say that somewhere is like so controversial now. Well, it's you know? yeah. And I mean, I've been roasted a lot for even hinting at it, but uh, it, it's very controversial. Um, but you, I don't know if this is at the end of your talk, Tom. You talk about how democracy relies on imperfect human beings. And I love that. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, you put it so el- eloquently. I encourage people to, again to see it because, uh, you know, it's not the perfect. It's not the pure who, and, and by that, I don't mean, you know, it's, Obama it's, quoting, we, we, look, quoting we talk the about man it. in the arena, which I hate, you know, it's not about that. It just means, you know, you know, meet people where they are and see what you can agree on and what you can get down. I'm not talking about self, the self-glorification of self-seeking politicians. I'm talking about ordinary working people who don't use the right words. And maybe you got to take a minute and explain to them that that's, you know, not how you ought to be talking about this or whatever. And maybe they'll explain something to you you don't know, too. You know, yeah. you open to that as well, you know. Look, it, it, you know... <laughs> We're all sinners. There is that is the sort of core, one of the core doctrines of the religion I was <laughs> raised in. We are all sinners. I don't you you cannot you cannot get out of that, and you can't 
like redeem yourself by having better language than somebody else. You're still a sinner. And I just, I just despise to my core this, uh, you know, the, the, the holier than now attitude. I just can't stand it. And it's, it is, this is how you, everything you just said it is exactly right this is how you build a movement this is how you bring change it's 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 how you you know get economic reform and yeah what can, and- what can i say richard the we on the left have we have forgotten that i wanted to talk about something else too if we saw time Shoot. i mean i i because I, I know you you've got your time is very limited yeah, well, I am getting older, but I think I got enough time to hear you finish. Uh, oh no, it's 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 something that has seemed more and more relevant to to me recently. You know, this we were talking about the culture wars, this feeling that everybody has that their culture is made by somebody else and they don't have a say in it, and it's beamed right. in from the coast, and it's just it appears on their TV screen, and somebody somewhere is writing it, but it's not them. And, uh, you know, and they, they know who it, they don't, they have an idea of who it is. It's, you know, it's the, uh, the people with fancy degrees, the people who run our society. But, um, uh, about a year ago, I read this book. It's called The Cultural Cold War. And it's by a British, uh, journalist. And it's about a, a group in the 1950s called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Very boring, mm. bland name. Congress for Cultural Freedom were arch cold warriors. They supported, it was this huge international group that supported, uh, magazines and public endeavors all over the world, uh, of what was called, uh, the anti communist left. And right. the, the, uh, including the magazine, the most famous example was the magazine Encounter. But they also, yeah. th- and they, they had, they had their, they had their fingers in everything and they, in, in the American foundation world and this sort of thing. Uh, so for example, like the magazine Partisan Review, which many of your viewers will remember, they had a hand in that. Uh, they had a, a hand in every intellectual controversy of that period uh, in the 1950s. And the whole thing was backed and paid for by the CIA, which we now know, I mean, thanks to this journalist who did this extraordinary, extraordinary work of digging, uh, you know, and discovering of these, uh, you know, all of these documents and interviewing the the various surviving um, officers from this uh, and this, this this sort of thing, and uh, I didn't know this uh, in, in until, like I said, I read the book last year, and and it, it was the book was hard for me to swallow, really hard for me to swallow because all my life I have looked at uh, intellectual controversy as a level playing field. Right. You know, uh, I, I started I started my own magazine in the eighties, the Baffler magazine, and and the idea was like, you know, there's there's a lot of nonsense out there in the world, but I'm going to start my own magazine, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, declare war on all of this, on all of this nonsense, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fight, and I'm going to win. Compete and we did- in the free marketplace of ideas. Exactly, but not just the free marketplace, the fair marketplace of mm-hmm. ideas, where where the best idea won out, and it never worked, Richard. Yeah, it it never worked, and I never really, and I'm here. I am fifty seven years old, and uh, it, increasingly frustrated. I mean, so you know, my last book was about populism, like what populism actually was. You know, I go on Twitter this morning, and someone has posted a long thread. About you know populism is a kind of proto fascism. Populism leads right, to right, authoritarianism. No, never and, yeah. and without any you know it's like what, what what can I even say? You know I wrote this whole book demolishing that idea, dynamiting that idea, tracing it to its historical roots and digging those roots up and and explaining why this is false uh, and what the word actually means. And it's it like it had no impact. It had no impact and. Well, I don't think that's right, Tom. I'm well, but but then let's, can we? Can we? Can, but I want to stay with this subject here, which is that the, that the world of ideas is not a right. level or fair playing field, uh, and that's that's what the message of this this story from the 1950s really is. There's a reason why certain ideas would be celebrated. the The people who had come up with them or had written the books would get foundation grants, would win prizes, would get fellowships, and then the ideas that were less um acceptable would would the, the people would sort of disappear in obscurity and that is the ultimate example 
of of what we're talking about here the culture being made by you, you, i'm reminded of this because you you've got a little figure on the screen here of of, of the man behind the curtain in the wizard of oz <laughs> yeah that's uh, the public doesn't see that but that's troy's yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that's 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 the that is like a, it's scary it's kind of a nightmare but I, I like for example when i was doing the baffler magazine we really admired partisan review we'd uh -huh. look at we'd look at old issues of partisan review and be like damn these guys were good look at the big names they got in here look right. at how well edited it is how well crafted the i mean this is what we want to do and uh and we tried we really tried and we did uh, we did a lot we did succeed in a lot of ways we got the big names we did the editing we did a great job but something was always missing and i now know what that something is no listen i i know exactly I, i've even experienced for example writing an article proposing an idea uh, regulating uh social media as a, as public utilities for example and uh, then he, a year that later, sort of has to happen, by the way. Six, it ha I mean, it has to. I wrote that in 2013. The, uh, six months later, the right person at the right outlet picks up the idea, presents it, but a kind of more inside the, uh, you know, guardrails way and gets a book deal and gets a, the, you know, I mean, there's, a, in other words, yeah, it's not a level playing field. It, 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 it hasn't been. And I think anyone's naive to think that, well, it may not be as overt as it was in the CIA's days so of the 60s, to think that the uh, discourse is not being manipulated in various ways. This is why um, well, well, there's, there's the a reason hatred that... and vilification of Democratic Twitter. This is why I had Matt Taibbi on to talk about the Twitter files, because I yep. do think it's important when the government, when political parties come in and say, suppress any discussion of an idea or a story. Or when uh, lobbyists do that or when professional associations do that. I mean, this is happening with the with the discourse around around yeah. covid and the vaccine. Right. The origins of COVID. I mean, this is this is crazy, uh, and and but now this is. I mean, you can say what you want about the 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 Twitter files, and I'm I'm perfectly willing to listen to all the criticism of it. But we now know that this is happening, or that this right. has been happening. It probably still is. And so, right. I mean, it's not like this stuff ever goes away. But uh, uh, and the ironic thing but, is that some of the harsh questions that they had from Matt Taibbi about them, I asked him. They didn't watch the segment. They they. Uh, they're not the be all and end all, but they are a sign of something much greater, Facebook and everywhere else, the manipulation of public information. And it's our. Well, you know, whenever you, you and, I, and you and I have talked about this before, what, what, because remember, I wrote about um, the lab leak hypothesis as the, right. the origin of COVID and the fact that this was censored for a while on, on Twitter and Facebook. It's like, who, who was doing that? Who, why did they do that? What's the machinery by which they decided to censor something? And, and like, how in the world did we get in a position where there is a corporation that is able to exert that kind of uh, authority over what Americans think and write and, and talk about? How in the hell did that happen? And you know what? And what are we going to? What are we going to do? What are we going to do about it? Liberals should be the ones most upset about it, and they're right. The but they they were they also, it, you know, well, that's because that's because so far it has it has flattered so far it has flattered them. Uh, if if they're answering to you know uh, professionals, that means that they're answering to. Remember, this is the model right, for exactly, the Democratic Party. Exactly. So, uh, so if if prof if this is just another way for professionals to moderate. Uh, the American conversation, then that probably strikes them as, you know, that is correct. That's what uh, professionals should be doing. But, uh, you know, that's that's also, I mean, this you is, and I know this because we've studied history. The problem with censorship is it always comes back and bites you, always. And this is, you know, you can you can approve of this all you want, but sooner or later, it's going to be turned on you. It's right. you know, uh, no question. And, and by the way, Tom, well, Frank, we're since we are, are running out of time, one little thing I wanted to ask you about in your video, which is uh, what the hell, America, which is what the hell, America, what the hell, America, what the, <laughs> fuck? What the hell, America, you talk about driving around Johnson County 
When yeah. you were a kid. Johnson, Johnson County, Kansas. Yeah. Johnson County, Kansas. Yep. I uh, don't want to get the wrong Johnson County. Blaring punk music. And uh, as one who was around, you know, and playing CBGBs and before that, the Mercer Arts Center at the birth of punk music, I want to know what you were listening to. Oh, man. So, well, it was the basically the very predictable soundtrack from that from that era. So I was a huge fan of like Husker Du and the uh, there was there was a local band called the Embarrassment. There was one called the Micronauts. But I'll tell you, the, uh, uh, I think I wrote about this in What's the Matter with Kansas the day I heard the Sex Pistols. Uh, now, this is still this is still the first time I ever heard them. This is still in my brain. It was like like it happened yesterday. And I heard them on the radio. So they, they, you couldn't hear. So in a place like Kansas City, you could in the seventies when the Sex Pistols were new, you couldn't hear them on the radio. They didn't play them. They were not played. And uh, at some point, I was up in Lawrence, Kansas, and I heard on the college radio station. I heard Anarchy for the UK, and I it was that Johnny Rotten's voice. Yes, yeah. that sneering, contemptuous voice, and it's also just a really good rock and roll song it is and uh, and, uh and and too. and i re i remember the day i heard it like it was yesterday and it was like i was instantly converted instantly converted uh and it was it instantly it was my anthem and uh yeah and then you know one thing led to another and so like i had the i would listen to the clash all that you know i'd listen of course to i know minor threat and government issue and all these guys <laughs> this was like Anyhow, local DC uh, bands, uh, yeah, and I, uh, yes, and but this is, uh, and I would, um, it, it anyhow, it doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. But that's that's who I was. It was a very important chapter of my life. I still listen to that stuff, uh, and I'm still try. I try to, I'm try to write about it from time to time, and I find that I never can do it justice. It's very tough to write about because it's at its best. It's anarchic. And yes. Well, there's something, there's something. Description. So this is we're getting way off the subject here. But uh, all my life, I've been fascinated by music, uh, especially rock music, and um, and frustrated by music writing. I hate music writing. There's it. It, it never. It, it never does it justice. All it's always it's like a kind of anthropological exercise. You know, uh, uh, this comes from there, and this this strain of it comes from this, and this strain of it comes from that. Yeah, who, it can be. Who that cares? Way. Who cares? It's got to come from love first, you know. Yes, exactly. And, and so, and I, I, and so I, I, every now and then, I try my hand at it, and I've, <laughs> I can't I've do it. A, I've published a few pieces, but it's tough for me to. Mostly, if I get a chance to interview somebody I admire, then I'll take the gig. But, but uh, no, it is hard. Although I will say, you know, the famous quote—I forget who said it—was writing about art. And it would apply to music is like dancing about architecture. It's meant as a put down, but I'd actually love to see somebody dance about architecture. I think that would be yes. an awesome. Look thing. at what I, here's what I'm reading right now. The oh my God, have you lost your mind? No, no, no. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm writing about this stuff now. I'm, you, you, oh, I you're, wrote you're about asking. I, I wrote about Ayn Rand. I read her stuff. She, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's a. Uh, it's the you know, bells talking, not 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 Ayn. Not Ayn Rand. I, so I find her. I find her more interesting than most people do. I, um, you know, the 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 politics of it are stupid, and the writing is quite bad. Her characters are terrible. They're wooden. They're wooden. They're two dimensional. But there are passages where she really rises to a kind of um, uh, where she can really do it. She can bring it. And I was like, that's weird. Now that what are those passages? And you know what it is? It's when she's describing machinery. You know, she, it's so interesting because she is, as you she were, is lyrical. She is lyrical when she's describing machinery. As you were saying that, I was thinking about her thing that the, the powerful entrepreneur is the motor of the world. That yeah, was, that's, that's it, kind of that's kind of brilliant. I mean, it's wrong, it's but of, it's kind of brilliant. It's wrong, yeah, it's kind of brilliant and, uh, you know, paging Dr. Freud, right? Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Well, yeah. it's all just it's all just warmed over Nietzsche. Her everything yeah. she does, everything she does is is taking Nietzsche and putting it in an American context where the businessman is the you know the Ubermensch, you know yeah, the superhero. Nietzsche was a more moral person than she was. <laughs> I, would, I, would I argue. don't know. I don't know. I I think she's like a carbon copy, not as not as inventive as Nietzsche, but although uh, they both share a, a kind of zest for physical aggression against women. <laughs> 
uh, which is creepy as hell. But, I, ha- I haven't got to that passage yet in the in the fountain. Oh, the rape I, passage? Yeah, yeah everybody says that's there. I haven't got to that yet. It's there, man. It's there. Uh, well, on the, a freewheeling discussion, as always, uh, again, I encourage people <laughs> to check out the video. What the hell, America? Did I say it right? What uh, the hell, America? What yeah. the hell, America? By Thomas Frank and um, uh, Anarchy in the USA. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as always, Tom Frank, uh, thanks for coming on the program. It was my pleasure, Richard, as always. Talk to you soon. And right. and we'll be right back. I'm Richard R.J. Scalian. This, believe it or not, is the Zero Hour. <laughs>